This is the coronoid process of the mandible. This is the mandibular condyle right here. Mandibular condyle, coronoid process. Coronoid means crown-like, and indeed this looks like the point on a crown. This is the ramus of the mandible, the body of the mandible, and the place where it attaches is referred to as the mandibular fossa. So the place on the skull that it point of attachment of the um, uh, mandibular condyle is referred to as the mandibular fossa. We take a look inside. We have what's called the myohyoid line, which is the point of attachment for the myohyoid muscle. And then right here is simply called the mandibular foramen. This is also an entry point for the um, mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. All right, let's move back to the sphenoid bone here. We see a couple of places here on the sphenoid, little wing-like structures, and these are referred to as the pterygoids. So this is the lateral pterygoid and the medial pterygoid. The lateral pterygoid is the point of origin for special muscles, which are thankfully called the pterygoid muscles. On the lateral side of the lateral pterygoid is the lateral pterygoid muscle, and on the medial side of the lateral pterygoid is the medial pterygoid muscle. These bumps coming out of the occipital bone are referred to as occipital condyles. And then this region right here, coming up off the occipital bone, is called the bacillar portion of the occipital bone. Notice within the occipital condyles are foramen. Actually, these are canals because they're a little bit wider um, in thickness. And so they are referred to as the hypoglossal canals. Down here are the condylar foramen. Hypoglossal canals are for the hypoglossal nerves. Condylar foramen are for what are called emissary veins, which we're not going to worry about so much in this class. You should know the foramen, though, but just because people get them confused with the hypoglossal canals. This is the styloid process of the temporal bone and the mastoid process of the temporal bone. In between the two, we have a foramen, which is used for the exiting of the facial nerve, and this is called the stylomastoid foramen. So styloid process, mastoid process, and stylomastoid foramen. Uh, back here, this is the occipital protuberance, right here. This is the point of attachment of the nuchal uh, ligament. And let's see what else we can do here on this skull. Yeah, we should actually look at some more of these little holes. The one right here in front that I've lost my probe in, it's a great big one, is called the jugular foramen. And then this one here is the carotid canal. J jugular foramen houses the jugular vein and also three of the cranial nerves, which would include the um, glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve, and the accessory nerve. The carotid canal houses the internal carotid artery. This hole here is um, the foramen spinosum. Foramen spinosum contains the medial meningeal artery. And then the big hole in front of it is the foramen oval. That is going to be um, the point of exit, if you will, for the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. These foramen are usually plugged. In other words, they have cartilage within them. On a real person, we wouldn't actually see holes here. These are referred to as the foramen lacerum. So they are just essentially a artifact of development. They don't actually have anything uh, passing through them. They are typically plugged with cartilage. Oftentimes their edges are jagged like a laceration, which is why we give them that name. All right, and we're going to take a look at the frontal bone again. These regions here are referred to as the anterior fossa on the frontal bone. And notice right in between the anterior fossa, we have part of the ethmoid bone sticking up again. This kind of depressed area with little holes in it is referred to as the cribriform plate. This is where the olfactory nerves rest. And this is the cristagalli. Essentially, it's a region um, where the um, olfactory nerves are divided. So cristagalli, which means 
rooster's comb and the cribriform plates. Now this is the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. So this is part of the sphenoid once again. And the greater wing of the sphenoid is here. You can appreciate that this depression in the middle, this whole depression, is referred to as the cella tersica. There are various regions of the cella tersica, but we're not going to worry about all that. We're going to worry about this general area as the cella tersica. Coming inside the cella tersica are a couple of holes going this way and this way. These are for the optic nerve, and these are referred to as the optic canals. Down here is the medial fossa, or middle fossa. And again, we have some of the foramen that we saw earlier. This is foramen spinosum. This is foramen ovale. And this is a new foramen right here. This is the foramen rotundum. Foramen rotundum is the place of exit from, uh, actually I should say entry, from the brain into the skull region for the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. All right, now the slit on the side is the um, superior orbital fissure. This slit is actually the region for exiting of a few nerves. One of them is the ocular motor nerve, followed by the trochlear nerve, followed by the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, and followed by the abducens nerve. All these have to do with eye movement with the exception of the ophthalmic branch of trigeminal and that has to do with feeling of the forehead. This is the petrous portion of the temporal bone. On the top we have a uh, little depression which we refer to as the superior petrosal sinus. This helps to drain the brain in part. And then if we follow the solitursica down to this slope traveling all the way into the foramen magnum. This is called the clivus. This is where the brain stem rests. Once again, we see these large jugular foramen. We see the foramen lacerum here. And then right here off the side are the carotid canals. Within the side of the petrous portion of the temporal bone are little holes which we refer to as the internal acoustic or auditory meatus. So this is the entry point for the vestibular cochlear nerve. On the other side, if we, if we go on the exterior, we see the external auditory meatus, and this is leading us toward the tympanic membrane of the ear. Those two are not really connected. Okay, let's take a look here some more. This is where the um, hemispheres of the cerebellum rest, and these would be the posterior fossa, posterior cranial fossa, transverse sinus, followed by the occipital sinus here, and the transverse sinus come around like this to form an S draining into the jugular foramen. That S-shaped one is referred to as the sigmoid sinus.